Well, in Chicago Ideas Week, did not tell me I was going to have to follow such stars, so <laughs> this was not fair. Oh, and before you start my clock, I just want to say that if this whole thing blows up, it's my fault, because I am a poster boy for technological dysfunction. So here we go. Oh, wait. Who? Hey, I didn't put that picture up there. That, that looks like it's from the, a daguerreotype from the 19th century. I was alive then, but still. <laughs> the English language is like the world's smartest dog. You can make it bark, heal, roll over, come when you call it. Writers play with that dog endlessly, training it to do tricks, hoping it will obey, hoping it will come when they call it. To strain the analogy, beginning writers do too, but their literary dogs are merely pups. The taller people walking around schools have one thing in common. They all want to make the smaller people more literate. Directing them to poetry, there's only one way of making them more literate, is a very difficult task. Just to ask a language arts teacher. One way this might prove um, less painful is through verbal leisure domain, or ludic verse, or simply wordplay. Helping kids, and I mean kids of all ages, to see the nimble, even the ab absurd extremes to which language can be taken. Uh, I think that's supposed to scroll. But maybe not. Oh, maybe I'm supposed to. Oh, push the button. Oh, OK. If you, I'm sorry, thank you. See? You know, I have, I have an 11 inch black and white TV. So this is like <laughs> panorama rama, rama vision. If you insist on calling it dog roll, fine by me. But isn't it better? to introduce kids to verse that they like, rather than have them grow into adults reading poetry, some for, perhaps for the first time, as if it's the Bhagavad Gita in Bulgarian. <laughs> I'm not here today to try to make you love poetry as much as poets do. In fact, what I'd like to do is make you hate poetry less than most Americans do including many teachers. I love teachers. I've met thousands of them over the years. But sadly, I think they're speaking from their own experiences in college, intimidating experiences, which have led them to project into their classrooms a minimal exposure uh, for for children. Poetry should be part of every child's everyday experience. Everyday experience. If students tell you that the poems they're reading are awful, let them go out to the playground. Or better yet, find poetry that engages them and excites them. And po this poetry that's fun doesn't have to be funny. Serious poetry can be every bit as rewarding. Ludic verse means playing word games. Let's be serious about wordplay for a minute. There are some poets who ridicule humor as being unworthy of poetry. Tickling the funny bone they insist, merits instant exile from the hallowed halls of poetry. Oh, I'm going backward, see? <laughs> it's the story of my life going backward. <laughs> right here at the Poetry Foundation, I am so happy to say, children's poetry has been 
welcomed warmly. Even though there are many well-known academic poets who believe that it sullies the august nature of poetry. Try this. Travel the world. Go anywhere. And you will find that the natives can always pick out Americans. Why? Because they're always laughing. <laughs> we are the most boisterous bunch on the planet. Everything's a joke. Everything's funny. <laughs> Except poetry. And of course, I exclude Tony and probably Ken when he gets up here, all these wonderful poets, Billy Collins and others. But they are the exceptions, I think, that prove the rule. There are 600 literary journals in the United States, give or take 20 or 30. Some of them really weird names like, can I have my ball back? And the bat shat. And this is my favorite, Psychic Mila. I was tempted to send some poems to this journal, and then I realized that only by getting rejected by psychic meatloaf can a poet know the true meaning of despair. <laughs> but all of these journals publish supposedly serious poetry. There's only one, one journal out of 600 that publishes light verse worthy of the name, and that is Light Quarterly. As Gavin Ewart, the British poet has said, has written, good light verse is better than bad heavy verse any day of the week. And no matter how much the purists howl, a little humor is not a dangerous thing. People often groan when they hear a pun. You know, all, puns, for example, all puns are wordplay. But not all wordplay involves punning. And people groan when they hear a pun, thinking that a bad pun is somehow a redundancy. But who begrudges Shakespeare his many clever puns, ribald puns? Brevity is the soul of wit, of course, as we've all heard. And I'm not encouraging kids to toss off throwaway lines. Yeah, I love that line. A good pun is its own reword. But this is weird. This is really weird. Carol Ann Duffy, Britain's Poet Laureate, has written that poetry is a kind of texting. It's a form of texting. And for the life of me, I'm trying to figure out what that means. <laughs> I mean, suppose Yeats had been writing poems his whole life, and he'd been told he had to write with his thumbs. <laughs> or pick up T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, open to the first page, and that first well-known line. What if he'd been writing it today? I mean, no one who knew the guy would ever say, oh, that, that Tom Elliott, what a kidder. <laughs> um, well, anyway, I would like to share with you some examples of wordplay, my wordplay. Um, and obviously, I'm just touching the surface here. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples. Have you ever gone into a cemetery and looked at the headstones? I mean, I have. And in fact, I've written a whole, I've written a whole book of them called Once Upon a Tomb, Gravely Humorous Verses. <coughs> so I'm going to ask you to suspend belief here and pretend you're, like you're walking with me through the cemetery. We come across the headstone epitaph for a gardener. When his days concluded, his final wish was granted. First he was uprooted, then he was transplanted. <laughs> and then right next to him says a, a tombstone for a lifelong reader. And all it says is, 
thanks for the plot. <laughs> Come on. It's not that bad. And then over by the bushes, there's one for a school teacher. Knives can harm you, heaven forbid. Axes may disarm you, kid. Guillotines are painful, but there's nothing like a paper cut. <laughs> and finally, over in the renovated section of the cemetery, fittingly, there's a tombstone for a plastic surgeon. He took in hips, he tucked in chins, he fattened lips and smoothed out skins. Unwrinkled eyes and narrowed noses. Now here he lies and decomposes. <laughs> Ask children to write their own, you know, their own epitaphs for favorite book characters that they have. Here's one for Pinocchio. Here lies. Come on, people, I don't have illustrations here. <laughs> Kids and animals go together. I like this one. I wrote one for a boll weevil, you know, that little boring insect. Wait for it, wait for it. Gone, but not for cotton. <laughs> Talk about groaners. Jeez. Here's one for a moth. Here lies a moth without a name who lived by the fire and died by the flame. <laughs> or maybe this one's better for a moth. In case I come back, leave the porch light on. <laughs> and this is one for a mouse, this last one. Miss the traps, miss the cheese, miss the cheddars, miss the breeze, miss the Colbys, miss the Swisses, miss the Munsters, miss the misses. <laughs> Did you hear that? Miss the misses? I'm oh. losing my voice. <laughs> no one will confuse these trifles with poetry. I'm not making that claim. But it seems to me they might serve as useful finger X's toward writing better stuff. Am I encouraging kids to write dog roll? No, nor should you. Urge them to practice writing, period. And not, by the way, for publication. This is a big issue with me. Oftentimes, teachers and well-meaning parents will urge, encourage, sometimes pressure kids to write poems, so they'll send them off to magazines and books to get published. And sometimes, a child will get a poem published in one of those doorstop tomes uh, <laughs> for which the parents will pay $75 uh, just for the, purp the, the, the purpose of seeing the child's name in print. Uh, ludicrous, meaning ridiculous, is a word that we've had around for 400 years. L ludic, however, meaning wordplay, has only been around for 70. I wish it a very long life. Another exercise that might prove useful, I've had fun with these. Uh, I call them mini book reviews. Have you ever wondered uh, <laughs> if so, why not let students choose a favorite book of their own and write a, uh, an encapsulated summary of, of the book? Think of it as compression calisthenics. And you know, just saying that reminds me, and there's another word play that I just love, uh, riddles. R kids love riddles because they're interactive. They're actually participating. I've done several riddle books. My latest is called Spot the Plot, a riddle book of book riddles, where I ask children to name uh, you know, a folk tale or a book or a story. Uh, here are two quickies. Uh, this t see if you can get these. Uh, I'm really asking, are you, are you older than a second grader? Are you smarter than a second grader? They're, they were for second graders and third graders. Uh, what was it? <laughs> this tale becomes a trail of crumbs. Hansel and Gretel, sure. Her hair's the stairs. Rapunzel, yeah, 
man, you guys are really smart. Um, so back to my mini book reviews, I thought, well, I should, you know, Moby Dick's a wonderful novel, but it's so huge. I mean, who knew you could spend so many pages writing about flensing? Uh, so I thought, I should do the world a favor and collapse Moby Dick into 10 words. So here it is. Man's obsessed, whale is gored, man goes a little overboard. <laughs> the Scarlet Letter. Pastor pesters Hester Prynne with an unoriginal sin, now remembered by an A, abominable red letter day. <laughs> I'm a Russophile, I've been to Russia 11 times, and I had to write, um, I had to write a, uh, a mini book review for um, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Student mad runs amok, murders two, worse luck. What then? Long discussion, guilt, more guilt. It's Russian. <laughs> Getting students to imitate poems they like is absolutely critical. And not as a license to plagiarize, but as a means of practicing. Here's a poetry, uh, uh, it's called a parody, of course. Here's a parody I've written of Edgar Allan Poe's famous The Raven. I've, I've, I've taken about 15 classic poems and rewritten them all as, oh my goodness, I'll never finish in time. Uh, <laughs> I've written, rewritten them all as, as, as uh, math problems. So each one has a numerical answer. This is becoming out in a book next year called Edgar Allan Poe's Pie. Once upon a midnight rotten rain, cold and rainy, I'd forgotten all about the apple pie still cooling from the hour before. I ignored the frightful stranger knocking, knocking, I sleepwalking, pitter-pattered toward the pantry, took a knife from the kitchen drawer, and yelled aloud, how many cuts, give me ten pieces. Through the door, the stranger bellowed, never four. <laughs> instead of never more. OK. Well, anyway. <laughs> a teacher's first impulse should be to try to get something down on paper. And parodies might be a way of doing that. Wordplay is a, many, is a, is a uh, many splintered thing, as I like to say. Uh, I was reading uh, Mother Goose Rhymes, because I was hoping to do a collection of my own. And I read this one. God made the bees, and the bees made the honey. The miller's man does all the work, and the miller makes the money. Uh, and I thought, I, I could write a whole bunch of those. Well, here are a few. God took a potato the size of a bus and created a hippopotamus. <laughs> God made the cow, and away she went, and she repaid God with 2%. God made the clay, God made clay, and the clay got wet, and God ended up with a chia pet. <laughs> God made the rooster, God made the hen, but Mom made the chicken pot pie, amen. <laughs> I don't know a single adult who is capable of convincing a 10-year-old that poetry is more fun than volleyball and video games, nor should we try. Entertainments are not zero-sum games. Why should my increasing love of soccer, for example, diminish by an equal amount my affection for verse? Both of them can intensify our feelings for the world and an appreciation of our places in it. So what is to be done? Put ludic poetry, ludic verse in your quiver. Parodies, I tell teachers this all the time, parodies, epitaphs, riddles, uh, spoonerisms, shape poems, rebuses, tongue twisters, even if you don't know what those are, Google them, you'll find out. Like sunlight and garlic to vampires, they are certain to keep the blue blood bards at bay. But more importantly, they will provide limitless lessons for, uh, for, for uh, 
young writers of all ages. None of it will be easy. Writing never is. But at every one of the 450 plus elementary schools I have visited over the last 20 years, I'm quoting Tony here too, I leave children with four words. Nothing succeeds like failure. Samuel Beckett said it best. Go on failing. Go on. Only next time, try to fail better. All right, let me finish with this. Uh, I think all of you have probably heard a little poem called On the Antiquity of Microbes. Um, it was. Uh, it's variously attributed to Ogden Nash, Shel Silverstein, Mrs. Anonymous, and so on and so forth. And, and it was changed, the title was changed wisely to simply Fleas, Adam, Adam. And so one day I was thinking, would it be possible to write a poem shorter than the world's shortest poem? So here it is. On the antiquity of Humanity. Only I changed the I changed it not to fleas but to flaws. Eve, leave, Aww. and so will I. Thank you very much. <laughs>